if you strip out the big changes in the last year or two, we'll actually have a long-run net migration number of around 200 to 250,000. So the sort of numbers we were seeing 2017 to 2019 will actually be where we'll get back to within a year or two. The big rise in the last couple of years, three big, three big reasons. One, the humanitarian schemes you've mentioned, uh, an increase in students. The universities have been recruiting a lot more international students in the last couple of years. And there's been an increase in the work visa programme. Some of that's temporary, and so we will get those numbers down. They will come down in the next few years. We'd expect to around about a quarter of a million, but they won't go any further than that. That's where the long-run trend is. Leaving aside the humanitarian uh, issues, um, can we talk about what's in the government's control? As you said, the, the government's made some changes to rules on workers and students. Um, do you think that the government's policy itself has contributed to these increases? Uh, well, I mean, clearly it has. I mean, the government has, for example, an international education strategy that says that universities should aim for 600,000 international students. The universities have delivered that. But you have to issue visas to those international students, so inevitably the net migration number goes up. Similarly, um, you know, most of the work route, uh, the majority of visas on that work route are issued to the health and social care sector, which is the one bit of the economy that the government control. So, you know, if you're going to bring in nurses, doctors, social care workers, you're going to have to issue visas for them. Uh, are you as confused as the rest of us by one part of government saying, let's kick up the numbers, more students, uh, more people uh, in health service and so on, and another part of government saying, let's get, it, get the numbers down to, uh, the net number, down to a sixth of what uh, they currently are? Well, I think there is a problem that um, if, if the government says we, are, we have an objective of getting net migration down to a certain level, they haven't, haven't actually come up with an explicit number. But if they're committed to doing that, you can't then say, but we need more visas on this route, we need more visas on that route. There needs to be some consistency. I think one thing that would be helpful would be if the government focused on the long-run numbers. So don't worry too much about the fact that it was 606,000 this year. We understand why that was. Um, the more interesting question is, if you get back to the average of about 250,000, is that acceptable? And if it's not, you will have to change policy to bring it further down. Oh, that's interesting. So, for example, you might think of a metric that looks like, I don't know, a three-year or five-year rolling average as the way of understanding what's happening. Yeah, I mean, in some sense, that's exactly what you need to do, because otherwise you come up with perverse policy. I mean, everyone supported the humanitarian schemes for Ukraine and Hong Kong. I don't think a single politician spoke out against it. Well, that inevitably resulted in a couple of hundred thousand extra visas. It would be bizarre if our policy response to that was, let's instantly slash some other part of the immigration system for that temporary increase. Let's think about the longer term and the more sort of stable position that they... So have. one change might be the way in which we... Uh, the headline figure, uh, b b which uh, the government uh, advertises. Yeah, so indeed, you could... I mean, you know, there's nothing to stop... Um, the Office of National Statistics publishing a range of numbers, and they could publish numbers trying to strip out, for example, temporary factors to see what... A bit like in inflation, we often look at the core inflation rate to focus on what the underlying inflation trends are rather than the headline rate. There are a couple of um, peculiarities in the numbers which I've, looked, I've seen and other people have picked up on. Um, for example, there are more Nigerian dependents of students than there are actual Nigerian students. Now, of course, you know, any student might bring partner and uh, a child, but it does seem quite an odd balance. So there's been a big change uh, in the last couple of years, and the government have obviously focused on this in their policy announcement this week. Um, I think part of it is probably the type of courses that students are choosing to do. So I think some of the expansion that we've seen are in one-year master's programmes in more vocational areas. And that's likely to bring in an older um, demographic than a, you know, a, a straightforward master's degree that's more academically focused. So perhaps it's more not surprising that they're more likely to have families with them. OK. The other thing which I was um, I was interested, I, I did not know this, we include Brits coming back to the UK uh, in these numbers, the 1.2 total who are coming in and so on. Um, and they account actually for 8%, uh, one in 13 of the numbers. Um, does that make sense? Well, it makes sense to count them because net migration is trying to measure whether the population's going up or down. And if more Brits come back from abroad than go abroad, that is increasing the population. So it's right to include them. I think it would be probably more sensible if, when we're thinking of policy to forget about that group, because I can't believe there's any minister in any political party that's going to start legislating against freedom of movement of British people into Britain. Let's talk about what is actually possible. The government says migration is too high. Um, 
the opposition, we don't not quite sure what they but they think, but they certainly don't want it to be higher. Um, do you think it is actually possible uh, by an act of will to bring down these num numbers by more than an, a, a sort of you know, accidental number to say reduce them by I don't know. 100,000, 200,000, a quarter of a million. I mean, in one sense, it's absolutely possible because the government has control of the immigration system. So having left the European Union, we control all elements, almost all elements, of the immigration system. So if they want to bring the numbers down, they can change the, the rules. I think the difficulty is, as we referred to earlier, is the difficulty of getting that past all the other government ministers that might have other priorities. So, for example, you could ban all workers coming into Britain. That would definitely reduce the net migration numbers. <laughs> it would be a pretty dangerous strategy to follow. But you can, you know, and so the question is, where do you tinker? And um, where do you draw the lines? Well, it's interesting. Um, last week, uh, Santony Selden, who was a vice-chancellor, uh, and Baroness Martha Lane Fox, the uh, tech entrepreneur, talking about education and business, both said that more worker, migrant workers and students were essential. Um, is there anything really substantial that the government could do that doesn't also kill either the education system or the, uh, or, or, or the economy? Well, so let's think of the, the economy as a good one to think about. So um, we bring in... Um, 100, in the last year, we brought in 100,000 workers on the health and social care visa. So that's... They were much... They account for about a seventh of employment in Britain, but over half of all work visas were issued to that sector. So how do you bring in the immigration down? Well, you have two choices. You either just ban immigration, that will cause devastation in the health service, or you, I don't know, come up with a workforce plan for the National Health Service. <laughs> you pay social care workers better, and you actually create the circumstance in which more domestic workers want to work in that sector. Well, uh, the, the Labour's come up with a, a, another proposition, which is that companies pay... Uh, that, which can currently pay workers uh, to fill shortage um, jobs, as defined by, by you. They can, the employers can pay them 20% less than British workers. Um, if that policy were enacted, what effect do you think it would have? Do you think it would work to bring down numbers, but would it have other consequences? So, um, I should start by saying that this is a policy that the Migration Advisory Committee has recommended to the government for the last three years. We never supported the idea of uh, employers being allowed to pay below what's called the going rate, because the going rate is there to protect British workers from being undercut and to protect migrants from being exploited by bad employers. So we've always supported that. I think, actually, the government is broadly supportive of that, so I don't think there's necessarily a big political divide here. Um, it won't have an enormous effect on numbers because, actually, the number of occupations that are eligible to pay below what's called the going rate is quite small. And even when they're eligible to do so, our numbers suggest that about 85% of jobs aren't actually filled below the going rate. So, it's, so it's, it won't change the net migration numbers really very much at all. What it'll do, though, is protect British workers and protect migrants, and that's important in and of itself. Professor Bell, thank you for um, a shaft of clarity there. Thank you so much indeed.